All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. We so appreciate it. And um, I'm Robin with the Ramsey County Historical Society. Um, we want to thank our panel tonight. But before we do that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe at the Eastside Freedom Library to say a few words. Well, thank you, Robin, and welcome, everyone. Um, we are <clears throat> totally enjoying these collaborations with the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Ramsey County Public Library System, particularly Roosevelt Library. Um, we're interested in bringing stories out of the margins and the shadows and bringing them into the center of our, our awareness. Um, and we're delighted that our Romanian neighbors and friends um, have been working for years to document and tell their stories in forms that we can engage them. Uh, we'll be in for a real treat tonight, I'm sure. Um, and so we wanna thank you for joining us. Encourage you if you're not already uh, on the mailing list for the Eastside Freedom Library electronic newsletter, please sign up. Um, you can go to our website, click on get involved, and that will give you the opportunity to click on mailing list and you can find out about all the other things that we're up to. So thank you for joining us tonight um, and um, have a great time and a great conversation. Robin. Thank you, Peter. Again, thank you all um, on behalf of the Ramsey County Historical Society for coming tonight. Um, I also want to thank the Roseville Library and the Eastside Freedom Library for their support and partnership for this History Revealed series. Um, it's been five years now, which is fantastic. Um, we'd like to urge those of you who are not members uh, to consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society or the Eastside Freedom Library or both of us. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our efforts. And you can check out our websites to see the benefits for membership. Um, our website is rchs.com. Um, on Thursday, March 17th, next week, we have another very special history revealed with Tikam Olam, Jewish women serving their St. Paul community with Kate Dietrich, Gabe Horner, and Janet Knapp. Uh, again, this will be an online program, so see our website for details and Zoom registration. As a reminder, keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off during the program, and you can put your questions and comments in the chat. And we'll read those out loud for our panel to answer. This program is being recorded and will be up on our Ramsey County Historical Society and Eastside Freedom Library YouTube channels in a few days. Also, after the recording and after the presentation and questions, I'll turn off the recording. And so feel free to stick around. You'll be able to turn on your microphones and cameras at that point, and we can share all together. We would like to acknowledge this sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, that's rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which RCHS pledges to honor the Dakota and other indigenous peoples of Minnesota Mekoche. So we, along with the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library are committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our com community. And to that end in 2022, we are working to bring you programs focused on our series, Making Minnesota, which will explore the often untold stories, histories and experiences of some of the worldwide immigrant African-American and indigenous communities that make up this, our most diverse county. So I wanna thank our presenters tonight. 
Vicki Albu is co-founder of the Heritage Organization of Romanian Americans in Minnesota, HORA, Romanian Genealogy Society, RGS, and the Dakota County Genealogical Society. Vicki's interest in genealogy and immigration led her to pursue a, deg a degree in history. She researched and wrote the screenplay for the award-winning documentary, A Thousand Dollars and Back, Recollections of Early Romanian Immigration to Minnesota. Gina Popa is one of the founders of HORA and its current president. She has dedicated her life to educating young minds. Her teaching career spans almost four decades working with students of all age, ages from preschool to young adults in Europe and the United States. Gina currently teaches ESL, which is English as a Second Language in St. Paul. In 2019, she was a finalist for, teach, for Minnesota Teacher of the Year, which is a great honor. Gina also believes that Hora's role is to invite everyone to experience the unique Romanian culture, history, and traditions right here in Minnesota. Donna Voller is Hora's Vice President. Donna came to Minnesota and the U.S. in 2003. She has a French and English teaching degree from the University of Potesi, Romania, and a master's in ESL from Hamlin University, Minnesota. Her first job was with Peace Corps in Romania, and that is where she discovered her passion about sharing her cultural and linguistic heritage. She is currently a learning and development consultant for Wells Fargo, and she volunteers and shares her knowledge of Romanian history, culture and language through the Hora language classes and event. So thank you ladies for being here tonight. We're looking forward to your program. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Robin. And thank you for this opportunity to share our experience and knowledge. Let's start today's uh, talk about, to learn a little bit about who Romanians are and um, for that, we have a little bit of information here. So estimated worldwide, we uh, Romanians are in between 26 and 30 million. Only about 20 million of those are currently in Romania. And that is an estimation because with the um, Romania being a part of um, EU, a lot of Romanians these days are in Europe um, working there. The population um, is majority Romanians. There are several minority groups, the biggest one being Hungarian, 6%, and the next one being Roma, about 3%. The main religion is Eastern Christian um, Orthodox, about 81% of that. I'm sure if you watch the news, you have seen lately where Romania is situated. It's in southeast of Europe. It's about the same size as Minnesota. Um, it is on the same actual um, latitude is 45 degrees, just like Minnesota, but it is much warmer because we, uh, Romania enjoys temperate continental climate. Therefore, everything is blooming right now in Romania. And that's about the time when I miss it so much. Um, we, of course, um, Romania is um, um, in its current shape since World War II. Between the World War I and World War II, Romania had it, its largest size. It was also called Greater Romania. Um, so before we go to the Middle Ages here, <laughs> Uh, the, the neighbors of Romania are Bulgaria and Moldova, Ukraine, Hungary, Serbia uh, to the southwest. And um, the, the part that where it was the biggest included some parts of Ukraine, Bulgaria, and Moldova. Um, it, the old Romanian kingdom was established in 1859. Um, through the un unification of Moldova and Tsara Romanaska, which were two of the territories. Now, um, in the Middle Ages, Moldova and Tsara Romanaska were ruled by voivodes, and you have a few of them here. 
The Tara Romanesca, known as Valachia, gained independence from the um, Hungarian Empire, Hungarian Kingdom in 1330 under Basarab I, that you can see on the left hand side. And the other rulers that we included here are known for, for uh, various accomplishments. For example, Mir Mirchad the Elder. Um, he defeated Bayezid, the Sultan of the um, Ottoman Empire, therefore stopping the advance of the Ottomans south of Danube. Of course, everyone knows Vlad the Impaler, otherwise known as Dracula. <laughs> um, he was definitely an adversary of the criminals and thieves. Michael the Brave, um, he united for a short time Wallachia, Transylvania, and Moldova, all three regions. And Konstantin Brunkovanu, he preferred to die instead of renouncing his Christian Orthodox religion. Now, currently, Romania is um, has the fourth largest economy by GDP with an annual economic growth rate of 3.5% as of 2020. Romania was a constitutional monarchy until the end of 1947. And at that time, Romania was under the Soviet Union army occupation and became a socialist republic. Um, it was a member of the Warsaw Pact. After the fall of the communism at the end of 1989, Romania began a period of transition towards democracy. It implemented economic reforms to move towards um, market economy. Um, it be, Romania became a member of the United Nations in 1955, joined NATO in 20, 2004, and became part of the European Union in 2007. And you see some wonderful cities and um, places if you are looking into visiting Romania. Those are some of the major um, attractions in the capital and Yash and Timisoara, the, one of the biggest, some of the biggest cities in there. Now, if you are more of a traveler that likes nature, plenty of nature to discover in Romania. We have um, the river um, Danube, which springs in the Black Forest in Germany and flows um, all the way through to the Black Sea, through the Delta, um, Danube Delta. You see here some of um, the mountains on the left-hand side, that is the Danube there. The, on the right-hand side, it's the highest and most dangerous road in, in Romania and some um, say even in uh, Europe, uh, Transpagarasha, amazing views. And if you make it at the end of it, the lake at the on the top fix a picture because um, <laughs> the lake up there. Um, if you are into monuments, we have our Arc de Triomphe, of course, the Triumph Arch in the capital, and the cross on the Pariman Mountains. You can see four towns from up there. It's my favorite place to go um, visit. And um, also the our Mount Rushmore version of Romania. It's on the De uh, Danube Delta. It's on the Danube River. And sculpted in there, it's one of the Romania's, da Dacia's old rulers before it became Romania or principality. If you like castles, plenty to see in here. You have um, all sorts of different styles from German styles to old medieval ones, even fortified um, cities. We have a bunch um, of those in Romania, all over Romania. So uh, feel free to uh, Google some of these locations or ask us about them. Visit our cultural center and we can tell you everything about, about them. Um, if you like the Delta on the left hand side, there's, um, you can visit those fortified monasteries as well as cities. And if you are just, um, if you lo love the touristic places, the Black Sea has a bunch of resorts there. 
We also have underground wonders, caves, and the salt mines you can see on the right hand side on the top picture. Um, we, Romanians have a, a unique sense of um, humor. On the left hand side, you see a happy cemetery. Everything that a person was about, their characteristics, their vices even, are written on their tombstone. So it is a place to remember the ones that have passed, but also share a laugh. Because of course, everything is rhyming. There is also a village museum in the capital where you can see transplanted from different regions of Romania houses just like ages ago. And you can take a historic train ride um, with the narrow gauge on the narrow gauge railway in Romania in the north part in Maramures. There's plenty of artwork and traditional crafts to be admired carpets, um, a loom there, um, pottery. Horezu is one of the famous ones. You can see them at the Village Museum and throughout the, the country when you go visit. If you are a culinary traveler, plenty to taste. We have a lot of wine regions as well as food. The particular um, picture on the right hand side, you can find in the end of October when the wine is not wine yet. It has a tingle to it, but not, it didn't become wine yet. So we call it juice, but you can get dizzy out of it. And you have a picture of pastrami as well. And I think I made everyone willing to travel right now, at least hopefully in your dreams. I think uh, next, one of the most common questions that we get at the Cultural Center at the Landmark Center in downtown St. Paul is, are Moldovans the same as Romanians? And for that, I will ask Gina to tell us. Um, yes, well, um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, so there is a Republic of Moldova which um, is an independent country and it's uh, nestled between uh, the northeast part of Romania and Ukraine. Um, there is also a part of Romania that's called Moldova. Um, so um, the Republic of Moldova used to belong to Romania. It was part of Romanian territory, but at the end of the uh, Second World War, um, it was. Um, um, decided, you know, the, when the, the territory was uh, divided between uh, the, the, the winning powers um, in um, Europe and the United States that uh, that territory um, went to the Soviet Union. So uh, later on, after the, the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, Moldova gained um, its independence. And um, you can see the, the flag is the same colors as the flag of Romania. Uh, it's just the emblem in the, in the middle is different. Um, so um, as it says right here, the most of today's Republic of Moldova territory was acquired by the Russian empire in 1812. In uh, 1918, the Moldovian Republic, Democratic Republic, um, they declared their independence and later was, they were united with the Romanian kingdom. Uh, 1940, Romania uh, ceded uh, Bessarabia and Northern Bukovina to the Soviet Union. So part of it went to uh, present day Ukraine and part of it went to um, the Republic of Moldova. Um, and um, that that whole uh, territory um, was part of the um, uh, Soviet uh, uh, Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic. Um, and then, as I said before, in 1991, the Moldavian SSR declared independence and took name um, uh, Moldova. Um, Moldova is a, a beautiful country as well and worth uh, visiting. 
uh, lots of uh, touristic uh, attractions, uh, lots of good food and uh, wine. Their wine is a little bit different uh, from the Romanian wine. It's more on the sweet side. So if you like um, sweet wine, there you go. Moldovan wine is uh, for your taste. Gina, another question that we get a lot at the center is, um, is Roma the same thing as Romanians? Um, yes, I know, because um, the history of Roma is connected to, um, to Romanians uh, to some extent, and there are a lot of Roma people uh, living in Romania um, today. Um, but um, uh, Roma people, also known as Romani in English, um, the traditional name was given to them in English um, is gypsies, which is considered to be um, pejorative um, in Romania. Um, and the old name is even Tsigani, um, which comes from Egypt, right? Um, and they are originally from the northern part of uh, the Indian subcontinent. It appears that they migrated first to Roman Egypt, um, and that's why uh, the name, right? Um, they um, were moved through the Arab Caliphate in the eighth, eighth century toward the western part of Asia Minor, and uh, eventually entered the Byzantine Empire in the ninth century. Um, in the Balkans, they were in the 12th century, and the oldest historical records in southeastern Europe are from the 14th century. In the 15th century, they appear to, um, to have arrived in Central and Western Europe. Um, so, in Romania, they are known today as Romi or Roma. Um, and they were slaves for a long time, for centuries. Um, in 1856, um, the emancipation of the Roma slaves um, took place in both Wallachia and Moldova, but um, they continued to, to be treated as um, you know, second-class citizens. And during the communist regime, um, they had really a, a, hard, a hard time, hard life. Do they speak Romanian? They don't speak Romanian. They speak their own language. Um, but some of their, their words entered the Romanian language. So um, Romanian, today, today's Romanian does include some um, words, Roma words, um, as well as words from other languages, because languages are fluid. Speaking of uh, languages, um, the Romanian language uh, originates in Latin. Uh, the name Romanian comes from Rome, uh, as the old territories of Dacia, the old country, were conquered and became part of the Roman Empire. The Roman occupation there lasted over 100 years, and the language imposed was the vulgar Latin spoken by the Roman soldiers, and administrators of the colony. It is the only romance language in, like it's like an island, right? <laughs> romance island surrounded by Slavic languages. Um, and um, different regions of the country, of course, they speak sub-dialects, um, but they, you know, all the people, they can understand each other other related dialects and languages, um, some of them have disappeared, others have been preserved, are uh, Daco uh, Romanian, um, R Romanian, Magleno Romanian, Istro Romanian. Um, some, there are some dialects like in Macedonia that, you know, uh, branched out of um, the, same, the same mother language, so to speak. So Romanian is, is in the same family, as you can see in the image, with Spanish and French and Italian and Portuguese, and they all come from, from the vulgar um, Latin, not the Latin that was spoken by you know, the officials, um, by the leaders in Rome, but like I said, 
um, it was spoken by the soldiers, the administration um, in uh, the occupied territories, in the colonized territories. Um, Thank you, Gina. Um, now that we know a little bit about who the Romanians are, where they're coming from, I think um, we can go about to find out who the Romanians next to you are in Minnesota. Oops, um, <laughs> more details about the language. So um, for that, I would like to ask Vicky to share a little bit about um, the circumstances around the arrival of the first documented Romanian immigrants to Minnesota. Okay, well, first I'll start with uh, the earliest records of Romanian immigration to the United States. And they say that there were a few Romanians in the California gold rush in 1849. I don't think they became wealthy. Uh, there were two in the Civil War, including a general named George Pomuts. And until 1895, the Romanians who came to Minnesota were mostly Jewish, who were denied citizenship and subject to persecution in Europe. Um, but after 1895, uh, we had a surge of ethnic Romanian men who began uh, departing for the United States from Transylvania and the Banat in the maps that you saw earlier, those did not become part of Romania until uh, after 1918. So they were mostly men from rural areas, uh, poor, uneducated, and they intended to come to the United States to make a thousand dollars and return home again. They were driven to leave partially by political reasons, but real, mostly it was due to economics. They had no money to buy land. So they, uh, along with other uh, Eastern Europeans, were coming to uh, the United States because they saw advertisements and letters from uh, friends and family in uh, already here. And they promised that America was a land of opportunity where the streets were paved with gold, which we all know is not, was not true. <laughs> They did not know that. So between 1905 and 1909 alone, over 70,000 Transylvanians left for the United States. And it's, it's difficult to um, measure the precise number of Romanians who came to this country because at the time when they were coming, their country of nationality was listed on documents as either Austria or, Austria or Hungary. And so therefore before 1920, they weren't counted as, as, uh, as Romanians in census or other documents because that typically recorded um, their, their citizenship. Uh, there was a, a column to indicate the ethnicity, but those, uh, you know, didn't, that wasn't necessarily what was counted. So the um, immigrants from Eastern Europe headed to the industrial centers of the American Midwest, and uh, Romanian uh, men held jobs in railroad construction and loading and stockyards and meat packing. So, uh, and just a few became self-employed. Uh, we have a lot of barbers, uh, Romanian barbers that were in the Twin Cities, some taverns and uh, rest, a few restaurants. But um, you can imagine South St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, to some extent um, in New Brighton that the, the meat, the animal raising, because they were used to being around animals, uh, meat packing and um, butchering were very common employment for the men who came. Um, they, they didn't have skills, so they're working at places like Swift, Armors. Um, St. Paul had a foundry and factories and railroad jobs. So this peak of Eastern Euro European immigration occurred between 1900 and 1925. Um, I think it's interesting that in 1920, there were about 29,000 people in South St. Paul, and that's more people than live, live there today. And of those 29,000, about 700 were Romanian-speaking men. And there were only about 43 women at that time. So we can see that the, the Romanian women were just beginning to arrive in this country. I think um, they were starting to consider staying here permanently when the women, when they started sending for their women to come. So, and during World War I, um, there was a concern over potential espionage by especially German aliens living in the United States. So the government required each enemy alien, they were called, um, to register with the US Marshals Service. And they had to fill out a form, a four page form that required them to provide their family information, details about their immigration, the language they spoke, a physical description, a photograph and fingerprints. 
And um, most of these records were destroyed uh, by authorization by Congress in the 1920s, but some survive, including state records for Kansas, Minnesota, Arizona, and perhaps a few other states. Um, later in 1918, then the state of Minnesota required all resident aliens age 14 older and older to register and declare their property holdings. So now the Romanians and other um, non-naturalized citizens, everybody who wasn't a citizen was affected by that registration law. So they had what they called alien registration days between February 25th and March 1st. It sort, sort of sounds like a fair or something, but I think it wasn't quite so uh, pleasant. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was pressure basically for these immigrants to become American citizens. And if they didn't, you know, they had to, they had to register. Um, for Minnesota, the 1918 alien registration records are held by the Minnesota Historical Society and State Archives. And there's an online index that's maintained by the Iron Range Research Center in Chisholm. These records are rich and they're really interesting to family historians. So if you have uh, an ancestor, even if they're not Romanian, who weren't, wasn't naturalized by um, 1918, you may find some really great information in these records. Um, we can find out whether they were speaking English, why they have not become naturalized citizens. A lot of times they said, well, I didn't know I had to be, or I don't speak the language. Um, we can find out what properties they own and the names and ages of their children and where their spouse was living and so on. And then you can see that typically the wife was, uh, if a man was married, his wife was back in the old country. So this requirement to register instilled a lot of fear in the immigrants who were afraid of being sent back to their country or just of being kind of ostracized by their neighbors. The penalties for failure to complete the form were very stiff and neighbors were encouraged to turn in people who didn't comply. So most immigrants did cooperate. At the same time, they were required to register for the draft. And some Romanian men who were considered aliens nevertheless volunteered or were conscripted into the American army. Um, later, of course, then the law changed and we kicked them out of the army, but that's another story. Um, so, but uh, as more Romanian women began, began coming to Minnesota and families began to think about settling here permanently, um, it, they decided that they would declare their intention to become a citizen of the United States. And the laws changed frequently, but typically the first step was to file a document with the court called a Declaration of Intention. That was valid for a period of seven years. And during that time, they were expected to learn English, remain employed, and prepare for naturalization. So this document, I know you probably can't read, but it's um, this is from uh, Katie Sarafolian, a housewife of 42 years of age. She renounced her allegiance to King Ferdinand of Romania in 1927. And it gives her physical description. It tells that she's married, where she was born, her current address, where she left in the old country, all kinds of details that you might not find anywhere else. The name of the ship she traveled on. And she had to make statements that I am not an anarchist. I am not a polygamist, nor a believer in the practice of polygamy. And there was a, actually a time during which um, if an American born woman uh, married an immigrant, she would become a non-citizen and would have to petition again for her to regain her citizenship, or actually her husband did. So um, it was, uh, I think, a challenging, a little bit different in those times. I think it's amazing that the Romanian population in the Twin Cities was large enough to support the building of two Romanian Orthodox churches in the first quarter of the 20th century. Um, really, there were not that, you know, we're a small number in the population, but what they accomplished is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, we have St. Uh, Mary's Romanian Orthodox Church in the Rice Street neighborhood of St. Paul, which was built in 1913, and St. Stephen's Romanian Orthodox Church in South St. Paul in 1924. So by those times, people were deciding, you know, this is a place where I think I want to stay. Um, they found the quality of life was good, and they could... Uh, afford more modern things. You know, we were going through this industrial uh, explosion uh, of jobs and production in the, in the Midwest. And so um, this was a place they decided that they would stay. Um, I like to remind people that the people that gave the money to build the churches were mostly poor people who worked as laborers in the packing plants and they earned less than 50 cents an hour. 
So for example, St. Stephen's Church in South St. Paul was built for a total cost back then of $25,000. And if you consider that the average salary in 1920 was only about $1,200 a year, that would be comparable to almost a million dollar building today. Uh, one story said that every payday, a collection was taken from all the Romanian businesses and uh, residents along Concord Street to raise that money. So the ladies from the parish would go down there on Friday nights after the people got their paychecks and they could cash them at the taverns that lined Concord Street. Um, and that if you're from here, you know, there were lots of them and it was really a good place to find a working man on a Friday night. So that's how they were sure to collect the money to uh, build this church up on the hill, which is a huge accomplishment to be up on the hill above Concord, above the Mississippi River. Uh, it sent the message, we have arrived. And it was always a, a priority and a matter of pride for Romanians to own their own property, whether it was the church or their, their own home. They didn't want to have any debts. Um, pr preservation of culture and traditions has also been really important. <laughs> the Romanians have been part of the Festival of Nations in Minnesota since its beginning in the 1930s. And the festival is a place to share and experience different cultures. Uh, you probably are familiar with the different languages, food, lifestyles, and dance that you can uh, savor and sample at the festival. And Hora continues to be involved in that to this day. Uh, around the conclusion of World War I, there were calls to limit the numbers and types of immigrants who are coming to our country. Many concerns related to skin color and desirability of different classes of people. Um, just for example, Italians, Romanians were considered, you know, not as desirable um, citizens. So in 1924, Congress passed immigration laws that limited the number of immigrants that could be admitted from each nation. And for Romania, that number was just 603, which resulted in separations of families because they couldn't send for family members to um, join them for some time. Um, later immigration waves from Romania were much smaller and they were related to political rather than economic conditions. After the revolution of December 1989, which brought an end to communism in Romania, um, thousands of new immigrants of all ages came to the United States from Romania. And I'll let Gina talk about that. Thank you, Vicky. So the idea of documenting our um, community history uh, began in uh, 2013 and um, it came about um, as um, Vicky actually and uh, Raluca, so two historians in our midst, um, insisted that, you know, the, the Romanian community has been here for such a long such time a long. and we don't have, uh, you know, documents we, it's not documented it's not put together um and uh, it's it's part of our legacy so we thought about it as a trilogy and we uh, proceeded to uh, record interviews of uh, oral histories and create an archive of unique romanian um, american immigration stories um, which are available to historians researchers and of course for educational purposes. Um, in this um, efforts, we um, had some um, partners in the um, Romanian Genealogy Society and um, Town Square Televisions and um, Twin Cities Public Television. Um, so we created two documentary films. Um, the first one is called $1,000 in Back, Early Immigration uh, Recollections from the 1900s, um, which um, Vicky kind of mentioned. So a symbolic title, right? The, the Romanian immigrants were coming, the first waves, they came here to work, make the $1,000, go back and, and purchase land uh, in their homeland. Um, the second uh, documentary is called Through the Iron Curtain from Romania, um, Immigration During Communist Era. And um, the third one is a work in progress. Um, it's going to document uh, the immigration after 1989. Uh, so um, back to the first one, $1,000 and back. This was our 
um, our beginning um, in our journey to, to document Romanian immigration here in our state. Um, as I said, uh, it documented stories, is, it recorded stories of early Romanian immigration to the communities in South St. Paul and St. Paul from the early 1900s until World War I. We have two, um, 12 audio and video recordings uh, conducted and recorded in 2013 by Hora and RGS. And the uh, documentary was completed at Town Square Television in 2014, and it received uh, a regional documentary Emmy Award um, nomination in 2015. Um, we got encouraged by this and um, uh, we continued with immigration stories during communist um, times um, and we have 15 oral history recordings. Um, of course, uh, the number of uh, immigrants uh, from Romania during this time was um, um, the numbers were, you know, fewer, fewer people who could escape. Uh, the traumatic um, uh, circumstances. Um, there was no way back for for these immigrants. You know, this was it. Um, it was their chance to get out of that um, terrible uh, place, and uh, they didn't know if they could ever uh, go back. Um, Romanians escaping the the communist regime uh, came from various backgrounds, and of course, from different parts of the country. This documentary, so the initial um, oral histories were recorded um, with the collaboration of Town Square Television, but then the actual documentary um, movie was um, realized uh, with, uh, created with uh, PBS Twin Cities and it was released in 2017. This documentary also received an award um, the Alianza Cultural Award. Alianza is an organization in Washington, D.C., um, and it has uh, U.S. companies and other institutions working together to strengthen the cultural, economic, and security ties between the United States and uh, Romania. It was uh, started by former U.S. ambassador to Romania, um, Mr. Rosa Pepe. The third one, which uh, we got a, a grant recently, uh, have been awarded a grant by Minnesota Historical Society. Um, we are, like I said, it's a work in progress and um, it shifts the focus uh, a little bit because um, we would like to capture the perspectives of the first and second generation of Romanian immigrants to Minnesota after the fall of communism, so after 1989. Um, and we see it as a multi-generational dialogue about identity. Uh, of course, this one will be um, in two phases, just like the previous ones. Uh, there will be first oral history uh, documented and then put together in uh, an actual documentary. Um, like I said, funded by Minnesota Historical Society, um, but it's a, a collective, a team work uh, with um, our partners, Ramsey County Historical Society, Town Square Television, East Side Freedom Library, Immigration Research Forum, and Romanian Genealogy Society. Um, recent immigrations, the first wave of immigrants from Romania after the fall of communism um, had in common education, which the first, as you heard from Vicky, the first um, waves, they, they were uneducated, um, peasants, no skills. Well, um, after the 1989, um, Romanian immigrants coming to Minnesota, they had education. Um, the first wave um, had no way back in, in the sense that they left their uh, positions, their jobs in Romania, and sometimes they had to accept uh, here, um, you know, take positions that were below their, uh, um, their education and their skills. Um, and 
you know that kind of chipped into their their sense of of uh, self and there was little time to plan they just had to had to leave uh pack up uh whatever <laughs> you know they could get and and just leave um after this initial wave, most Romanians came to the United States for work, uh, for school, careers, um, for looking for a cultural or economic uh, exchange, uh, for marriage, uh, or by visa lottery, like myself. Um, but this time, it was no longer a one-way trip. There was a choice. Um, going back, if things didn't uh, turn out the way uh, people hoped um, they would be here, they, they could go back. So mobility, which did not happen before. The current Romanian community in Minnesota, um, according to the last, uh, the latest census, there are over 5,000 Romanians in Minnesota, uh, not including Moldovans from the Republic of Moldova. Um, and um, um, they are concentrated in the major cities in St. Paul, Minneapolis, Duluth, Rochester. Um, like Vicky mentioned, there are two Romanian Orthodox churches in St. Paul and South St. Paul. And um, there are also some Moldovan Baptist churches. Um, children of immigrants, um, you know, there are some identity issues. Um, sometimes relationships with their parents change. There is pressure to um, integrate into the new uh, culture, into the new society, but then the parents put also pressure on their children to preserve um, their native language and traditions. Um, but as they age, you know, um, they turn to um, return to their roots and, and, and seek um, their heritage, and uh, it's like a it's like a circle. It's very interesting. Um, language and traditions are usually lost with the loss of elders, um, because children go to to school. They speak English, and um, if there is no communication with with their grandparents, um, then the language is lost. But um, thanks to Hora, RGS, and the Romanian churches, um, the customs and the heritage language um, help, their efforts help retain or renew um, these traditions and, and the Romanian language. Hora is offering uh, Romanian language classes. And I will turn to Dana. And before we go into, into what activities Hora does, I want to share with you a preview of the first documentary we mentioned. <laughs> Romanians began immigrating in large numbers to the United States in the early 1900s. I imagine it was just to have a better life. You can imagine how adventurous uh, you'd have to be to, at the age of 20 to leave your wife and daughter and come all that way to America. The commonly held belief is that immigrants to America came here to start a better life. The fact is many Romanian immigrants came to this land of opportunity with no intentions to stay. Most of the early Romanian immigrants were men with a mission of Mia Shi Drumul, or a thousand dollars and home again. They weren't particularly uh, excited about existence in Romania at the, in those days. It must have been quite tough. They were happy to come to the United States, make a thousand dollars and perhaps move back and buy some land. I'm sure that there were Romanians over here already that he was communicating with and that told him how uh, how the streets were paved with gold. <laughs> At the turn of the 20th century, ethnic Romanians were spread across a vast territory that was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Civil unrest and disputes amongst ethnic groups dominated the politics of Austria-Hungary. Conditions were desperate. Phil Tuckanita recalled his grandparents were motivated to leave when they sensed that war was approaching. 
they uh, immigrated a little later. Uh, I would guess somewhere around 1910, 1911. I'm sure it was to dodge uh, the forthcoming First World War. The decisions for immigrants to leave their families were difficult. There are many heartbreaking stories of families who became separated for years, some of whom were never reunited. They would, they would separate and they would, they would remarry only to find themselves out, find out later that they found themselves and there's nothing that they could, they could do about it. Some very, very heartbreaking stories like that had occurred. Blue collar jobs were easy to find before the depression, but the work typically involved hard physical labor. That's why they settled in South St. Paul is because the Pacanos, it, it provided uh, employment, but the Romanian community was here. This is where the Romanians came. They came here and in St. Paul, uh, right around Rice Street area. The railroad industry employed many Romanians and other immigrants in the business of loading and unloading trains and maintaining the tracks and equipment. One of these was Phil Tokanita's grandfather. He was a painter's helper, and he worked for the railroad, which was very nice, as he called it, the Northern Pacific, and it went to Navy Org and Iowa, Iowa and New York. I saw St. Paul Circle and his work in the packing houses. My father quit school when he was 14, and his brother Peter quit school when he was 13. They had to go to work. That's how they made the money in the, in the stockyard. They worked very, very hard. He uh, was in World War I, got gas. Uh, back then, they had gas masks, so he got gas and developed TB, and he died. In later years, he, he was 34 years old. He was born in 1900 and he died in 34. Both planned on going back and they sent money back to their parents. My brother was born then in 1914. The World War I was on. My half brother Mihai in Romania was already uh, conscripted into the army at age 16. By the time everything was over, and my brother and I being Americanized, my parents realized that one broken home to uproot us and take us to a foreign country was not in the best interest, even if they could afford it, which they still couldn't. It was sad because they always hoped that they could. It got to the point where there was no one there anymore. Thank you for your patience of wa watching that. If you want to watch the whole documentary, um, we offer it at the Cultural Center in St. Paul at the Landmark Center. What else does HORA do? Let's uh, find out. We are a nonprofit organization. We were um, established in 2009. Our mission is to preserve, promote, and share our valuable cultural heritage. And um, of course, forge partnerships and collaboration with Romanian organizations in Minnesota and across the US and not only Romanian organizations. We partner with um, a lot of different organizations. We do design, organize and participate in cultural activities for the Romanian American community in Minnesota and other states. We have galas, festivals. We do participate in the Taste of Romania Festival of Nations, Balkan Festival, urban exhibition at the Landmark Center. We do um, historic and traditional celebrations, artistic and educational events and presentations and exhibits like the one we have currently and I will talk shortly about it. We also um, promote local artists. We document Romanian immigration in Minnesota as you saw. We like to collect and archive art artifacts. And we have several programs, Romanian language classes, um, youth internships, 
Stitches of Love program um, that is about cross-stitching, but more than that, it's about um, recreating the Romanian shirts called Ie that we all brought from home. The shirts are usually made by my by our grandmothers, uh, mothers. Um, some are hundreds of years old, and we have worked during COVID to recreate those patterns. And we have a surprise for you in the next months. <laughs> Um, the, we opened the first Romanian American Cultural Center in Minnesota in 2019, right before the pandemic hit. It is located in room 319 at the Landmark Center in St. Paul, so feel free to stop by and visit us. We are open for now only Sundays from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, we are looking for more volunteers. If you know of any, please let us know to be able to open um, in longer times and other days as well. Um, we like to call the center a place to gather, celebrate and share Romanian traditions and culture. It is welcoming, a welcoming place for everyone. And it is possible due to support from grants, donors, collaborators and volunteers. What else we do at the center? We hold a library about over 700 titles, so anyone can come and borrow. Um, most of the titles are in Romanian, but we do have bilingual titles about history, literature, art, um, philosophy, different titles. We also hold Romanian elections in there. We're a polling station. Um, we facilitate informational presentation and film screenings. We have one coming up in April in Chaska. If you live um, around that area, it will be an in-person presentation. So watch social media for more news on that. We promote Romanian culture um, everywhere we can. And we have member and donor events. This is your Stitches of Love project you have on the uh, right hand side there, a few examples of the stitches that we created and our the community, um, the Romanian community in Minnesota has created in the last year. We are, um, we have a project of putting them all together in the shape of the state of Minnesota. So watch for that. You can see a glimpse of it at our exhibit at the Landmark Center. It is a Romanian spring traditions exhibit, and it is located in the North Gallery of the Landmark Center. You can find out about specifically about spring traditions and about the Stitches of Love uh, project that we have. And it is open um, now till, Mar till April 16th, till Easter. Visiting hours are Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, and Thursdays it's still 6. The hours are a little bit later. And Sundays the building opens at 12, so it is 12 to 5. So you can go between those hours at any time. Our wonderful volunteers are there to explain um, everything that is uh, and more than is in the, in the exhibit. The exhibit is curated by um, um, our historian and Wonder Woman, Raluca um, Octav, and it was also possible due to a grant um, from MRAC. Um, so thank you, thank you for all the state of Minnesota. Just a glimpse of um, what traditions you're gonna read about and see in this exhibit. It's, um, we focus there only on the spring traditions because they're the happiest ones and the, the most numerous ones. But in general, Romanians have a rich folklore that covers all aspects of a vi villager's life, birth, death, crop sowing, um, harvesting, marriage, and many other. So um, we have, It follows the um, agrarian shepherd calendar. They're, um, they overlap 
with the Greek Roman holidays, um, Tracian, Jito, uh, Jito Dach, Dacian customs, and um, so it, it's a it's a mixture of different traditions from old times with more um, common ones. The the first one in the spring that we have is our Valentine's Day, which is not on February 15th, but the 24th. Spring, of course, is the most exuberant and colorful and engaging of all. It's when the cold recedes and the green appears. And of course, they go around the Easter, which happens to around the the um, the same time as um, the Catholic one. March 1st, it's a unique holiday where uh, we give little trinkets and you get to see them at the exhibit. It's, of course, they all have to have the red and white string that you see here. It's a silk string. And you find this, this culture, this um, tradition also in Bulgaria and other Eastern European countries. We offer it on March 1st, usually women wear it till March 9th when um, on, on their lapel, when they hang it in a tree. Easter, of course, with all the celebrations um, re around this religion holiday with the painted eggs and the food, the amazing food that we have. Each um, Eastern European country that has this tradition of painting eggs has specific uh, patterns on it. So for uh, Romanian eggs are different um, from the color. The color is really uh, different on them. And all the Easter celebration, all the spring celebrations and with Sinziene, which is around, it is on June 24th. It's a, a pagan festival that celebrates ancient goddess, the earth, um, and of course the summer solstice. It is also a flower, laid its best straw. It, uh, of course, it's a celebration of life and fertility, um, and you can read more about it at the exhibit. If we fast forward a little bit through the summer, there's um, all sorts of traditions where women um, get their match um, and it, with some of the uh, the religious holidays as well. They follow the crops and in the fall we have fall harvesting um, celebrations. The winter holidays are again, um, of course, like any other culture, very intense. We do have um, a picture here from the American Swedish Institute that where we had an exhibit uh, before with the um, with the Romanian choir as well. Some traditional Romanian food because it is evening and we're ready to have dinner is that sweet bread that you can see at all major holidays and the stuffed cabbage, which is characteristics for a lot of Eastern European countries, but um, it tastes different on each household you go because everyone is pickling their own cabbage. So it will, it never tastes the same as my mom makes, made them, I swear. We do have um, Christmas and New Year's Eve holidays in caroling specific um, for wishing a new happy year. On the right-hand side, you have the goat caroling um, and some masks as well. Right here, you have the bear caroling. So these, the both the goat and the bear happen on New Year's Eve. And it's not good to ignore them if you want to have a next wonderful brand new year, because they're wishing you all the best. Of course, we do have children New Year's Eve as well that are caroling um, in specific, specific verses to wish you a happy new year. And with that, we are at the end of our presentation and I will stop 
sharing my screen so we can answer some questions. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, Gina and Vicki. This was a wonderful presentation. So we have a question in the in the chat from Sue, um, which goes back to one of your earlier maps. Um, why did Romania cede those two areas to the Soviet Union? Yes, I can answer that question. So um, that's a good question. We, we did not give those uh, parts of our country uh, willingly. <laughs> um, history is complicated, right? And um, it so happens that um, um, in the Second World War, um, because we had a German king, uh, we had to be on the side of the Germans to begin with. Um, then at some point, um, the Russians came because they were very close and they uh, forced the king to abdicate. And we had to switch arms um, against the Germans. Um, as a result, we lost people on both fronts, on the Western and on the Eastern uh, front. But um, it, uh, that didn't matter Ed, because um, we were, you know, um, in the beginning, we were on the wrong side of history. It didn't matter that at the end, uh, we were uh, with the allies, we were punished. And um, when, um, you know, at the end of the war, they, when the territory was decided, um, of course, the, the big lion, Russia, uh, took its share um, and it chopped um, up our country. Uh, we lost other, other parts, uh, not only the ones in the north, we lost uh, parts in the south to Bulgaria and uh, to Serbia. Um, so that's, that's why um, the Romania looks the way it does um, today, um, because we lost, we lost territory at the end of World War II. Thank you, Gina. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Donna just put the link in the chat for the um, documentary preview. So check that out. And then Krista had a comment that Unity Church Unitarian uh, here in St. Paul has a partner church in Transylvania, uh, which is the homeland of the Unitarian faith. And um, Unity does some regular pilgrimages over there with uh, congregants and ministers going to uh, stay with villagers. Oh. And um, I know that's a program that was on hold for COVID, but I think it will be starting up again. Um, so we have some more information on Hora also in the chat. Uh, check out the exhibition at Landmark Center. Um, it's I, I have not seen it yet. Um, I've been working at home this week, but I'm looking forward to going in and seeing it. Does anybody else? Oh, Linda had a question. Um, the second movie you mentioned, is that available for viewing on YouTube or on TPT or? We have a two minute preview for that. I'll look right now to see if I can find it. I think um, if you Google it, I think you can watch the whole uh, movie at, at TPT. Okay. I think, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but there is a question, um, can, I, can somebody purchase um, oh. the $1,000 in back and through the oh. IRS curtain? We have mm -hmm. them for sale at our cultural center. So if you stop by and visit us um, on Sundays from between one and three, we have plenty of copies and of course you can purchase them. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions right now? Okay. Um, oh, Krista mentioned that she has seen the Behind the Iron Curtain on TPT, and it is great. I've seen pieces of it, and it's. I'm looking forward to seeing the whole thing. And it 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 is a really well done, really well done documentary. So congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. And I just wanted to add that uh, from time to time, TPT will show it, will broadcast it on um, their um, TPT Live, I believe. So if you get the, the, uh, the program with their schedule for, you know, um, the month, you might be able to, to watch it on, 
on TV, actually. Um, Nancy had a question if there was similar Romanian immigration to other states and probably in terms of numbers or mm -hmm. types of workers. Yeah, actually, uh, one of the things that surprised me the most about uh, studying Romanian immigration was how mobile the people were, um, because I see the people in Minnesota had been in St. Louis before, or maybe Chicago, and maybe they were in Philadelphia. Minnesota is actually one of the um, probably smaller uh, destinations number wise. Uh, uh, like Pennsylvania, the coal mines in Pennsylvania and uh, uh, Chicago, uh, steel mills and things like that in Pittsburgh were big destinations. So if you're researching uh, Romanian roots, uh, check out Romanian genealogy and we have some really interesting posts on the Facebook page, but you'll be surprised that your guy that you thought was only in Minnesota pops up in Chicago and St. Louis and everywhere in between. Mm -hmm. And I will add that, um, yes, there are large, um, Minnesota has a small concentration mm -hmm. of Romanian immigrants compared to other mm -hmm. places. The largest um, uh, numbers are on the coasts. So New York, um, Los Angeles, um, then in Chicago. In Ohio. Ohio, yeah. yep. Cleveland and um, Canton. But I remember, um, visiting um, Ellis Island once and uh, they have an, uh, an interactive uh, map where you can put an ethnic code and then it lights up the states where Romanians, you know, the, your um, um, group is um, in. And I was shocked to see that there were Romanians everywhere, even in mm -hmm. Alaska and Hawaii. Yeah. So like yeah. Vicky said, very, very mobile. They're everywhere. Very, everywhere yes mm -hmm. um before we get to um una's question nancy had another question as to where um people can listen to romanian traditional music donna <laughs> traditional romanian music uh well mm -hmm. first things first you can come to the center and we can play some music for you right there um you can google um on youtube um, you can, um, if you watch our events, uh, the churches also have, um, have events as well. And they, we, uh, they have, there's a, a dance ensemble, um, is Vorashu, which, um, they not only you can hear the music, but you can, they, you can see them dancing and you can even join them if you want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Learn some Romanian traditional dances would be great. Um, so the other question before I turn it over to Peter for his questions or comments is, uh, what is it that makes you say, I am proud of being a Romanian? Uh, <laughs> well, um, we were born there, right? And um, no matter, no matter how far we are uh, from there, it's, the language that we we speak, um, that we we learn to say our very first words, and um, the landscape of Romania, as you could see from from the images, it's um, it, it's an amazing place. It really has uh, everything that that you um, could wish for, and then the people. The people are um, are wonderful and. Um, Right now in the difficult situation that um, our neighbor Ukraine is going through, um, I am proud to be a Romanian and to, to see that Romanians are helping, Romanians are ready to take care of uh, the refugees that are coming across the border. Um, and, you know, like a good neighbor um, taking care of each other. So. I'm proud of my people. I'm proud of my my culture, of my history, of my language. Um, that that makes me say I'm a proud I'm a proud Romanian. Thank you, Gina. Um, Peter, did you have any words before we turn off the recording and let everybody share? Well, I'm I'm struck by the choice that this group has made uh, to look at their history in the United States or in Minnesota 
as consisting of three distinct periods. Um, and I'm wondering what connections you see uh, between these periods, uh, the ways that perhaps the first wave of Romanian immigrants, that their children might have played a role in acclimating and socializing and educating the new wave of Romanian immigrants that came after World War II. And again, the relationships with the Romanians who came uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, are there connections, uh, were there connections um, across these three distinct uh, waves or phases of immigration? That's about uh, 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Vicky. <laughs> well, one thing that I'd like to say, because I don't know if this answers it exactly, but one, one thing is that we're very fortunate to be doing this project now, that we have the state of Minnesota and our legacy funding for these grants, because I'm going to get all verklempt. <laughs> but um, the we didn't have the opportunity to do this with the first and second generation. Nobody did that then. And so we don't know what it was like for those early generations, but I'm sure that it was very similar. We know that, you know, that it's typical that the first generation comes and the second generation has identity uh, problems and challenges. And so this is a great opportunity for us to document that. And um, I think we're really fortunate. Um, and then your other question about connections, I'm not sure if you meant like familial connections or, or what, like, did you I think mean, that, do the different um, waves have connections? I mean, often in, the, in patterns of immigration, the children of the first wave of immigrants get education in the United mm -hmm. States and they become school teachers mm -hmm. and social workers um, or politicians. Mm -hmm. and, and so that second generation is in a position to help new arrivals gain access to resources, figure out how to survive in the United States um, with this sense of three very distinct waves. Mm -hmm. um, are there stories that you've heard or come across of how people are connected? And maybe the three of you are good examples of, mm -hmm. of, of making these <laughs> kinds of connections. Yeah, I think absolutely. I'm actually more Norwegian than I am Romanian, but I identify more as a Romanian um, because of my connections. And um, I think that we have together, we all have different perspectives and it makes for a great um, diverse uh, perspective when we're doing these projects. Um, and, and there are connections through, I mean, it's amazing that we're all related. I mean, all people, I think we can probably find a genealogy connection to everybody, but it's really surprising. There've been a lot of situations where we find out that people, you know, recent Romanian immigrants are, are related to other people and they didn't even know it because their ancestor, maybe their great uncle or second great uncle or something came over here mm -hmm. and this chain is still connected. I think that's pretty amazing. And I think a, a common trade, um, trade um, Peter, is the fact that um, in all these waves, you know, Romanian immigrants came and they, uh, with or without education, with or without um, skills, they were um, determined to, to integrate into the American society. They learned the language, they embraced the new uh, culture, they uh, pushed their children to, to go to school and to study. And like you said, um, yes, uh, Romanians are, are known uh, for contributing to the uh, you know, growth of uh, our state. Um, and they are professionals, they, they study hard um, and you know, they, they um, 
yeah, they contribute in so many, so many ways. Um, and then, yes, they um, they greet the newcomers. Um, the churches are great places for um, new immigrants, and they um, guide them into, you know, their first step here in the United States and help them. I. Um, I am a re recipient of, of that. When I came, I remember at the, the church at, at St. Mary's, um, there were people, the, the priest uh, himself, um, he, he greeted us, he helped us. And so, yes, there is a culture of, of uh, you know, a pattern of, of helping each other uh, succeed into the new world. Absolutely. Thank you. So my last question comes from my own particular interest in the labor movement. And I, and I wonder, you know, what have you found? You've talked about the meatpacking plants and South St. Paul, and what have you found about the relationship of Romanians to the labor movement here in Minnesota? There's a little, there's a passage in A Thousand Dollars and Back where we're interviewing Joe Stoy, who was actually one of the, um, he was a uh, labor leader at, at uh, I don't know if it was Swift or Armors now, I can't remember, I should know that. And uh, he talks about how they didn't have any, you know, it was not a, a five day work week or there wasn't overtime, you know, it was a very different environment. There was no OSHA, there were no safety. Um, so I, I feel like uh, the immigrants to this country, not strictly Romanians, but all the immigrants, they built this country really and uh, made a lot of things better. Uh, through their through this process, they learned and uh, made and motivated and, and made changes for the better. So yeah, definitely things have changed a lot uh, in the last hundred years. Thank you. Well, Robin, why don't we go to a more informal setting here for the last part of the evening? Yes, I want to thank Gina. Donna and Vicki for this wonderful presentation. And um, there's a lot of information in the chat, um, information about music and so forth. So everybody go and visit Landmark Center, check out their, um, their cultural center and the exhibition. And again, thank you all for being here tonight. We hope to see you next week. And 